Tonight, the alarming coronavirus surge in America. Nearly half of all states reporting rises. Florida surpassing the 100,000 mark. A staggering jump among young people. More cities requiring masks. But in the one-time epicenter, New York City, a hopeful milestone. Two more Trump campaign staffers test positive after that Tulsa rally, at least eight now infected. And as the president heads to Phoenix tomorrow, the stunning claim about killing the virus from the church hosting his event. Just hours until John Bolton's book hits shelves, his new warning about grave consequences for national security. Will House Democrats force him to testify? The massive show of solidarity at NASCAR after a disturbing discovery. The FBI investigating a noose left in Bubba Wallace's garage stall. Outside the race, Confederate flags flying after NASCAR banned them. Police under fire, mourners paying respects to Richard Brooks in Atlanta. A rise in sick calls after officers were charged in his death. Plus, the NYPD officer caught on camera using a banned chokehold. What's now happened? And the cutting-edge new screening for COVID-19. Our look at the first airport to roll it out in the U.S. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. I'm Savannah Guthrie in for Lester. And tonight, the coronavirus is making a disturbing comeback. 23 states reporting cases are up, in some dramatically. Experts say it's not just because of more testing. It's sick people in hospitals. And after crowded scenes like these unfolding from California to Texas and Florida, young people are increasingly in the crosshairs. We get the latest now on where the virus is spiking and the signs of rebirth in the nation's once hottest spot, New York City. NBC's Carrie Sanders leading us off. Today, Florida broke an unwanted record, now with more than 100,000 cases of coronavirus. Doctors say in a state without uniform rules, including to wear masks, this was inevitable. But there's been a shift in who's getting sick. The average age now, 37 years old. We're seeing a, a major shift in this direction with this large 20 to 30 uh, year old population, uh, mostly asymptomatic. Absent state rules, some Florida cities like Miami and Tampa now mandating masks. Here in Immokalee, Florida, a farming community, one in 25 people recently tested positive for coronavirus, mostly migrant farm workers who are now headed north following the harvests. North Carolina on edge tonight with a steady rise in cases, 870 now hospitalized. Our numbers of hospitalized patients requiring oxygen as well as those who are requiring life support is rising. It's very overwhelming. Nationwide, 23 states, nearly half the country, are seeing an increase in cases over the last two weeks. Eight of those states seeing a spike of 100% or more new cases. In Georgia, the largest group testing positive, now between the age of 18 and 29. We're now beginning to see more of a younger population. And what that causes as a nation, as you can see, is our cases are going up but our deaths are going down. While in Texas, new mandates after a surge in hospitalizations over the weekend. NBC's Morgan Chesky is there. In an effort to curb the recent spike in cases, mandatory mask policies are now popping up in Dallas and other cities. Meanwhile, officials have shut down at least a dozen overcrowded bars, partially blaming them for spreading the virus. With rising cases in hospitals in Arizona, nurses from Colorado now heading there to help. They traveled from Phoenix to Colorado to help us, and so when the need arose, it just, it was kind of a no-brainer. A public health balancing act where finding footing remains an indelicate science. Kerry Sanders, NBC News. This is Gabe Gutierrez in New York, the one-time epicenter of the coronavirus, which today hit a major milestone, phase two of reopening. Outdoor dining, retail stores, and barber shops are back. For me, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I mean, I have cabin fever. Nelsi Perez was among the early shoppers at Old Navy's flagship. We've been waiting for this since the moment we locked the doors. For some offices, seismic changes. So as we're walking through right now, our temperature is being scanned. 
Thermal scanners now flag employees with potentially high temperatures. The temperature is 97.1 currently. For more screening, Scott Reckler, the CEO of RxR Realty, showed us how elevators read key cards to know what floor you're going to, and employee arrival times are staggered to limit how crowded they get. This elevator knows exactly where we're going. It knows where we're going, and it only allows four people. So this is how the workplace will look for the foreseeable future. We call this the new abnormal this period between when we have a vaccine and when we have to work like this and you know, coexist with the coronavirus. At the start of the crisis, we visited Manhattan's Westway Diner. Since then, business has been brutal. We had to let go temporarily all of our employees. And we had to shut down a business that's been here for over 30 years. Today, Pete Daphno set up tables outside. Is this sustainable? It's not sustainable at all. Four tables aren't going to make a difference. He wonders whether the state waited too long to reopen. Today, the governor defended the cautious approach. Following the science works. It, was, it saved lives. And he says he's now seriously considering restricting travel from other states like Florida that are seeing an uptick in COVID cases. Savannah? Gabe, thank you. Former National Security Advisor John Bolton is again unloading on the president today before the release of his new book. Meanwhile, there are new coronavirus concerns about the president's event in Arizona tomorrow. Here's NBC's Jeff Bennett. Less than 24 hours before his book hits store shelves, John Bolton again taking aim at his former boss. The biggest fear I have is that his policy making is so incoherent, so unfocused, so unstructured, so wrapped around his own uh, personal political fortunes uh, that mistakes are being made that will have grave consequences for the national security uh, of the United States. Bolton also saying he won't vote for the president. I'm not going to vote for him in November. Certainly not going to vote for Joe Biden either. House Democrats say they're considering calling Bolton for new hearings while slamming him for refusing to testify without a subpoena during their impeachment proceedings. To the length and degree that he indicts Donald Trump, he also indicts himself for cowardice and for greed. President Trump hitting back at Bolton, calling his former national security advisor a wacko, grossly incompetent and a liar. Meantime, the president is also facing fresh fallout from his weekend campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for using a racial slur to describe the coronavirus crisis. Has more names than any disease in history. I can name Kung Flu, the Chinese virus. Today, the Trump campaign said two additional staffers who worked on the Tulsa rally have tested positive for coronavirus, bringing the total number to at least eight. The president was asked about his event tomorrow at an Arizona megachurch. We're going to always learn about safety. We want to get rid of this thing. Meantime, leaders of that church in an online video today say they're using new technology they claim kills coronavirus. And it kills 99.9% of COVID within 10 minutes. It's ionization of, of the air and it takes particulates out and COVID cannot live in that environment. But medical experts say even if it worked, it would not prevent transmission through coughing or other means. Be it ionization technology, whatever it is, if it's not directly between your face and the person standing next to you, which is why we really you know, uh, recommend that people don't attend mass gatherings, especially. We reached out to the church for comments. So far, no response. But organizers say they're requiring face masks at tomorrow's event. Savannah. All right, Jeff, thank you. And the questions are only growing tonight over the president's abrupt firing of one of the most powerful prosecutors in the country, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. Democrats are crying foul, and now the White House is responding. Here's NBC's Stephanie Goss. Tonight, Democrats calling for an investigation into the sudden firing of U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Berman. Senator Chuck Schumer writing a letter to the Department of Justice Inspector General. Over the past two days, this sordid, ham-handed plot by President Trump and Attorney General Barr to oust a well-respected U.S. attorney played out in public view. The shakeup happened late Friday. Attorney General William Barr announced in a press release that Berman would be stepping down from New York's Southern District. Berman quickly responding that he had no intention of resigning. U.S. attorneys are appointed by the president, who can remove them at any time. The president fired Berman on Saturday. The White House says it was just a personnel move designed to find a position for outgoing SEC chairman Jay Clayton.
Barr was working on a smooth transition, and when Berman chose to respond in the way that he did, uh, he came to the president, and the president agreed um, and fired this individual, Mr. Berman. President Trump appearing to distance himself from the decision on Saturday. We have a very capable attorney general, so that's really up to him. I'm not involved. The surprise move led to Democratic accusations that the White House was trying to obstruct ongoing investigations in New York's Southern District, an office that has looked into President Trump's closest allies in the past, including personal attorneys Rudy Giuliani and Michael Cohen. But Clayton is unlikely to be confirmed by the well, Senate before November's the election. The acting U.S. attorney now is Audrey Strauss, a registered Democrat who was Berman's deputy, meaning any current investigations in are set to proceed. Tonight, several law enforcement sources tell NBC News that there are no unannounced investigations that the Southern District of New York is working on that could have triggered this firing. Savannah? All right, Stephanie, thank you. In Alabama, a moving and dramatic show of solidarity today at the Talladega Speedway. NASCAR rallying around Bubba Wallace, the sport's only full-time black driver, one day after a noose was found in his garage stall. Tonight, the FBI and NASCAR are investigating. Here's NBC's Sam Brock. The entire garage area, in a sign of solidarity, has rallied around Bubba Wallace and a rejection of racism. NASCAR drivers walk alongside Bubba Wallace's car, number 43, overcome with emotion. A despicable act by someone. Less than 24 hours earlier, a noose was discovered in Wallace's garage stall, prompting this response, I will not give in, nor will I back down. I will continue to proudly stand for what I believe in. NASCAR confirming to NBC News that no fans have access to that garage, only a few essential personnel. The organization vowing to investigate and declaring, we are angry and outraged and cannot state strongly enough how seriously we take this heinous act. The FBI's already on scene tonight, with the U.S. attorney in Birmingham investigating possible violations of federal law. Let's go shut these haters up. Today's race, the first opportunity for general admission fans to get back on the track and also the first test of a Confederate flag ban, championed by Wallace and unveiled by NASCAR June 10th. It's not a, a race thing. It's it's about walking into a, an event and, and feeling uncomfortable. That's it. Fans on their personal property failing that test. Confederate flags flap next to pop-up gift shops and on top of Winnebago's. Wallace's fellow drivers voicing zero tolerance for any of it. I cannot believe the hate that someone can have in their heart. Tonight, drivers banding together. Bubba Wallace standing anywhere but alone. NASCAR's president, Steve Phelps, said he was the first person to talk to Bubba Wallace about the noose. He said it was a difficult moment for him. It was a difficult moment for me. He also said whoever is responsible for this act will be banned from the sport for life. Savannah? Sam, thank you. And calls for racial justice are also growing in Atlanta today, where members of the public paid respects to Rayshard Brooks. Here's NBC's Blaine Alexander. Lying in a shining gold casket, the body of Rayshard Brooks arrived at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once served as pastor. Tomorrow, his daughter will speak at Brooks' memorial service. Today, people waiting, at times in the rain, to pay their respects. It's about a stand of solidarity versus white versus black, cop versus non-cop. It's humanity versus inhumanity. Brooks, who died 10 days ago during a police encounter in a Wendy's parking lot, has become the latest rallying cry for those demanding police reform. In Atlanta, the city's police department acknowledges a higher than average number of officers calling out sick following last week's charges against former officer Garrett Rolfe and officer Devin Brosnan. Explanation for calling out sick vary and include officers questioning their training, officers being challenged and attacked, and unease about officers seeing their colleagues criminally charged so quickly. This, as departments around the country face increased scrutiny. This video shows an NYPD officer appearing to use a chokehold while making an arrest. Yo, stop choking him, bro! Just days after chokeholds were outlawed in the state. Within hours, that officer suspended without pay. That person was dealt swiftly with, was suspended, and we will continue to uh, treat that seriously and continue to emphasize it in training. Back in Atlanta, a bond hearing for the officer charged with Brooks' murder that was supposed to be held tomorrow has now been postponed. Blaine Alexander, NBC News, Atlanta. 
And in 60 seconds, the stunning toll of racism on the mental health of black children. It's the focus of our series, Inequality in America. Back now with a crisis in our country, a staggering rise in suicide attempts by black children. NBC's Rahema Ellis now with one mother's heartbreaking message. And we want to note, if you do have youngsters in the room, some of what's discussed is troubling to hear. The little dude, so happy. From birth, seven was his parents' joy. The child doctor said Tammy Charles couldn't have. You're a miracle baby, huh? Absolutely. I told him over and over, Daddy and I love you so much, and this is something that we always did. But last year, at 10 years old, they lost him to suicide in their home in Louisville, Kentucky. We teach our children about stranger danger or guns or, or any other type of outward hurt that we try to protect them from. This is one that was bl I was blindsided by. My 10 and a half year old son my miracle child, my only child, was dead. A study commissioned by the Congressional Black Caucus shows in recent years, self-reported suicide attempts by black teens increased by 73%. The rate decreased for white teens. Black children younger than 13 were twice as likely to die by suicide than white children. Really shocking. NYU professor Michael Lindsay led the study. Why is this happening? I think we have to talk about the uh, racism and discrimination that is prevailing in our society. That trauma, I think, is engendering a sense of hopelessness for kids, wondering if, if their life really matters. Tammy advocated for her son, trying to get him help, and worked with his school after she says he was bullied, called the N-word, and choked on the school bus just months before his death. I miss most his smile. I miss calling his name, and I miss hearing someone call me mommy. That is what I miss the most. Nationwide, black and brown children are less likely than non-Latino white children to receive mental health services. Philadelphia psychotherapist Salima McNeil is trying to change that raising money for free counseling for families of color. We really want young folks to know that they aren't alone. Now more than ever, our folks are actually open to the healing and willing to get the healing. Healing for Tammy is sharing her son's story. If you don't have children, or if you do, tell them you are loved, you are important, and if there's anything that I can do to help you through, please tell me, talk to me, please hoping other parents never experience her pain. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. Such an important message. And up next, the new coronavirus airport technology. Will it make it safer to fly? One of the country's busiest airports is rolling out a cutting edge new way to screen for COVID-19. Here's NBC's Gotti Schwartz. At LAX's international terminal today, a new layer of screening just before the TSA checkpoint. A thermal imaging camera now scanning thousands of passengers, both arriving and departing. All making a temperature reading within milliseconds, and anyone with a temperature of above 100.4 will then be approached for a secondary screening. And if they have a fever, they'll be asked not to fly, while information on arriving passengers showing fevers will be passed on to the CDC. The rollout, the biggest infrared screening program yet in a U.S. airport, but similar to what's already being used in Asia and across Europe. But health experts in the United States warn the new technology isn't foolproof. It will not stop any asymptomatic carriers because they do not have fever to, to speak of. Since the early days of the state lockdowns, air travel is up 300 percent, but still just a fraction of what it was last year. For now, the program at LAX comes with limitations during its testing phase. Images won't be stored, and departing passengers with fevers will only be advised not to fly. We're not going to stop them from traveling, and we're not going to tell the airlines that they have a fever. Um, we're just going to give them this advice and let them continue on their journey. All coming as airlines have struggled with social distancing and mandatory mask wearing on flights for months. Now officials hoping a new layer of screening will add additional protection and could be a sign of what's to come at airports in the future. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Los Angeles. That's Nightly News. I'm Savannah Guthrie. I'll see you tomorrow morning on Today. Have a good night.
Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.